Heather, please. There we go. Let's, let's turn to page 20. Page 720. We'll sing this song good and loud together. Brother Steve, that's not your fault. That's mine. This thing got turned off. Page 720. Sing it out. Jesus loves even me. Let's sing right out. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me even me. We haven't sung this song in a while in my mind. As soon as we started singing, it went to uh, back to Sierra, Sierra Leone, uh, Africa, when I was there, and uh, in a little tiny bamboo church. Um, the, the English is the official language of Sierra Leone, but it's, it's spoken with such a, a thick accent. I don't even know how to describe the accent. You really can't understand what they're saying, and they, they, mix, they mix different dialects with it. So it's really, uh, if you just show up in Sierra Leone, you'll think you're hearing a different language. But they sing this song. And I'll never forget, somewhere I've got a picture of uh, that little bamboo church, maybe 20 people, 25 people packed in there, and they're singing, Jesus loves even me, and the smiles on their face when they're singing about Jesus loves even me. It got me thinking about people in other parts of the world, Uh, Bhutan, for example. They have no idea that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, loves them. I mean, what a, what a privilege we have in this country to stand and sing this song together and to sing it from an experiential standpoint. We've all, if you're saved, you've experienced the love of God and you're able to testify about it, but there's people around this world who, who don't have that testimony. They, they don't have any idea what it is to be loved by God. And when we were in Nepal a few years ago, I, I, I sat down with a woman on her front porch and through a translator uh, explained to her just so flawlessly. I impressed myself with how I expounded to her the gospel. And uh, she cut me off. She, she heard enough. She cut me off and she said something and my translator kind of giggled. And I said, what'd she say? She said, she just, she just wants to know how to have this God that loves her. And so I thought, well, there's no way she can understand it that easily. So I began to talk to her again and she interrupted me again and she said, can I just have the God that loves me? And she, it was foreign to her, and the idea that there was a God, the God, that loved her personally, it just was more than she could handle. We take it for granted, don't we? We take it for granted. Let's sing the whole song again. It's a really long song. It took three minutes to sing it. Let's sing the whole song again. Think about what you're singing this evening. God being our helper, we're going to see that the people of Bhutan get to read for themselves the message of God's love, Jesus Christ on Calvary. One day they'll be able to read it for themselves. Won't that be wonderful? Let's sing it again from the beginning, page 720. Make sure you smile while you sing it. (laughs) I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. 
I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, that shall my song What a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. All right, let's bow together. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll sing another song this evening. Father, Thank you for another chance to gather together like this. Lord, it is a wonder that you would love us. Uh, God, we are so grateful that you demonstrated and displayed your love for mankind in the form of your son on the cross. Lord, thank you for that sacrifice. Now, God, tonight I pray that you'd be lifted up and glorified in all that we do and say here tonight. God, would you bless the singing, Lord, as we read some missionary letters in a few minutes. Would you please burden our hearts once again for our, these missionaries and their families and their ministries that you've called them to. <clears throat> and then, Father, as we open your word in a little bit, God, would you find our hearts sufficiently prepared to receive all that you have for us. Well, thank you. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Leonard, let's sing one more song. Number 129. We'll sing all four verses of At the Cross, number 129. My Savior bleed and did my sovereign die. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rode away. It was there by faith I received.
I forgot to dismiss the children a minute ago, so all the kids going to their classes tonight, you can go at this time. And we're going to be way down in number this evening in kids. But the Wiredmans are sick. Half of my kids are sick. Kimberly Dwight's kids are sick. Um, Luke Leonard's family is out of town. And so it's just that time of year, I suppose. But I'm glad that you're here. Let's read some missionary letters tonight. We do not need to stop the live stream for these. And... Um, We'll jump right into these. We'll start with the Lee Cadenhead family. They are our missionaries in Zimbabwe, and great things happening there. This is a lengthy letter, and so I'll, I'll try to um, condense it. I'll, I'm going to cut out some of the parts, um, but you can find the letter in its entirety um, on the missions kiosk. One of the things that I, I wish we could do better about in this part of the service, and we just can't, there's no way to do it well right now, is a lot of these missionaries include pictures, very small pictures, and if we try to enlarge them, they would be so pixelated you wouldn't be able to see them, but you can find them on the missions kiosk. You can see pictures that correspond with some of the events that are mentioned in our prayer letters, and uh, pictures from Zimbabwe especially, and even South Africa. Um, these are some really amazing pictures I would encourage you to take a look at as well. Uh, this is, for, again, from Brother Lee Cadenhead and his family in Zimbabwe. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, church planting is an important part of our ministry, objectives, and natural outworking of our evangelistic and discipleship efforts. But there is another important part of our ministry that I am coming to see as a work of reformation. There are many churches in Zimbabwe. However, few of these churches faithfully preach the gospel of Christ. And I'll stop right here and say that this would be the same testimony of so many places in this world. Um, in the last century, lots of churches has, have been started, many by Baptists, but many by other denominations. But as, as is so often the case, even in America, as time goes on, there's lots of compromise within those churches. Brother Brendan Hazel Schwartz would tell you the same thing. Brother Brendan White would tell you the same thing. And it's the case here in Zimbabwe as well. He says... Um, uh, we regularly encounter sincere churchgoers and in some cases pastors and church leaders that need to have the way of God expounded to them more perfectly. I regard this as a part of our ministry here in Zimbabwe, equipping existing churches and church leaders, irrespective of denominational affiliation, but to preach the gospel with clarity and instruct God's people in sound doctrine. There is a need for reformation among the churches here, and we have reason to hope that some measure of reformation is possible." Then he includes some bullet points here along those thoughts. Uh, he, the first one is, for about four months, every Sunday afternoon, he's taught our basic biblical discipleship material to a small group of uh, meeting at their pastor's house. We spent weeks going over the gospel and then proceeded with topics like eternal security, water baptism, and the Holy Spirit. It says you need to keep in mind that he's talking about pastors that he's talking about. These pastors have no concept of eternal security, uh, the true biblical baptism, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Uh, these are foundational beliefs, uh, but a lot of these church workers, they've just never been taught this. He says, we, we previously reported on accepting an invitation to hold a Tuesday afternoon Bible study at a nearby local church where we taught on the new birth over a period of about 10 weeks. Every regular participant in that study got, got sorted out on the way of salvation during the study. Uh, and then next bullet point, for the past two months, we've held weekly Bible studies at church, uh, at a church in a place called uh, Chig Chigadora. I really missed Brother Luke tonight. We have taken weeks to slowly and carefully teach through the first two discipleship lessons on the subject of salvation. We had about 50 souls complete the lesson, uh, lesson and questions and earn their own Bible. Many have made professions of faith. The pastor of this church, a man in his 60s, has now completed the first 10 discipleship lessons on his own. The pastor has just completed basic discipleship. Um, he said, the next bullet point is, we recently trained the board members of a student ministry organization to give the gospel using an illustrated gospel book developed by Stephen and Laura Holt. Uh, they are missionaries in Sierra Leone, uh, West Africa. Uh, while the board members were from diverse church backgrounds, it was a joy to see them sharing the same gospel message to college students at a recent student conference. Um, this section of his letter is entitled Right Division. In the month of May, we provided a week-long module covering the topic of rightly dividing the word of truth. The majority of those in attendance were our own men, but we also had a few church leaders from other churches participate. It was pretty heavy material, but the men seemed to follow well and ask great questions. It was eye-opening and should make a big difference in getting this group of men rooted and grounded in sound doctrine. In June, we hosted our first stateside guest for a short-term mission trip. Shannon and Micah Woodard, 
are part of our stateside church family, and their visit was an absolute treasure for us. Brother Shannon jumped right in with our regular outreaches, and Miss um, Miss Micah helped my wife to uh, wife to hold a three day children's program in two locations. It was a good success with more than 200 children participating. And one of the highlights was in seeing more of, of, of our church folks participate. What started with just Kelly and Owen has blossomed into a genuine local church ministry. In the past month, we have also had new doors of utterance open unto us in some public schools, including a high school and primary school in two locations just outside the city. I was also given the opportunity to preach at a student conference held at Marymount Teachers College where I preached the gospel to around 250 college students and also taught from the book of Haggai on being stirred up to work for God. He says, please forgive the length of this letter. We are truly grateful for your prayers and support of our family. Uh, National elections will be held here in Zimbabwe in August. Elections in Africa are always fraught. Um, they are. They, please remember us in prayer as we seek to conduct our affairs in wisdom and avoid the political tension surrounding us in Christ, Lee Cadenhead. And again, there are many pictures associated with that letter, and you ought to go by the missions kiosk and take a look at those. Now, this is a letter from Brother Brendan Hazel Schwartz. He was with us shortly before his departure back to Kenya, uh, but um, and so he he briefly mentioned some of the stuff in this letter. Uh, but we're going to read the, the letter in its entirety tonight, just so we all know what's going on with the mother there. This is his May. 2023 prayer letter. His next one will be available shortly, I hope. It says, the month of May opened up as usual with the Pastors Practical Training Academy. We had 10 pastors who made it to Nairobi for the training this month. Uh, Peter Morris and I were able to look close able to close out our lessons on soul winning, and it was a blessing to hear the reports from the pastors and results they have been able to see in their, own, uh, in their soul winning. As soon as uh, the conference came to a close, we, I was extremely busy getting everything prepared for our team member, Andy Ritchie, to take over as we were flying out for our first furlough on May 12th and returning on June 21st. In this very short amount of time, I was able to finish up some discipleship and soul winning with Daniel, and I was confidently able to leave soul winning, discipleship, and follow-ups in his care while I was away. Brother Brandon mentioned while he was here that uh, he did, that Daniel did an extremely good job uh, carrying on in his absence. He says, Andy has been very good to me by updating me at the end of every Sunday and sending me some pictures of our people. It's been encouraging to hear what he had, uh, that we have had many visitors over the weeks, and at last two of them have, at least two of them have made uh, decisions for Christ. On Sunday, Pastor Emmanuel, the national pastor from Andy's church, was able to meet with a few of the older children and go through the gospel with them. Um, uh, we are excited to report that eight of them placed their faith in Christ alone. Andy has also been so kind to meet with Lewis every week which I have been while I've been away, and the reports from both Lewis and Andy have been very uplifting. We have been blessed to see many family members and friends while back on our first furlough, but we are excited to get back home to Kenya to see what the Lord will continue to do through the the Bible studies previously started. And there's some more information in the letter. There's also some uh, some pictures there of the Bible studies. And then lastly, we're going to hear from uh, the Smiths. They are... Uh, we took them on for support as missionaries to China. Uh, throughout their course of deputation, the Lord shut those doors in China uh, legally. They'll never be able to get back in. Uh, but uh, they just shifted gears and moved to Taiwan. And uh, they are, I don't, I don't say a whole lot usually about missions boards, uh, but um, if, you, if you work with missionaries, if you schedule missionaries, if you try to vet missionaries and ministries, you're undoubtedly going to have to work with some missions boards. And I will say this, um, the walls... And, and the Smiths are out of, uh, their, their mission board is Vision Baptist out of Georgia. Vision Baptist has gone through a major transition in the last few months. And um, I, I was very, very cautious to see how the transition at their missions board, the leadership and some things changing there. I was curious to see how it was going to affect them. And I was hoping that it would have no bearing on the, on the burden and the boldness of the Vision Missions Board missionaries. They are some of the most effective missionaries on the mission, for, mission field, in my opinion. Uh, some of the most effective missionaries that we have today. And uh, Brother John Walls, and that's who our, our boys are with. Some of our boys are with them right now in Taiwan, seeing that ministry. Uh, Brother Walls, his method and his process for church planting is second to none. And I'm happy to see Brother, uh, Brother Smith falling right in line and doing the very same thing when he gets there. And you'll understand why I say that, because it'll sound a lot like Brother Walls' ministry as you read this letter. Here's what he says. Update from Taiwan. This is his June prayer letter. Summer has not even officially arrived, and I'm already melting and sunburned. Besides trying to stay hydrated and cool, this month has been busy with Bible study, fellowship activities, and outreach. We are still meeting with a young family in our home, as I mentioned last month. 
So there's the beginning. His ministry is brand new. He starts by meeting with a young family in his home. That's very important. I think this is biblical missions. Look, look at the book of Acts. This is, this is how they did things in the book of Acts. We are, uh, he says, we're still meeting with that family. They have not seemed very responsive to the message, but they are still willing to come and study. The husband also came to our men's activity last week. We pray that hearts will be open to the seed of God's word planted in their ears. Planted, uh, plant, water, and pray are all we can do. It is the Lord who makes, the, makes things grow. In addition, this month I have been finishing up on ongoing project to reach people on the streets. Uh, the hope is to put the gospel in a place where people see it. Most people seem to live on their mobile phone, so I made a simple card, a few questions on one side, and then a QR code to scan for answers on the back. Once scanned, people are shown a gospel presentation. After that, they can then contact me if they want to know more. I am excited to see what the Lord will do with it. Uh, that exact outreach method in the TFM course are... Uh, our TFM students are required in one trimester to create from scratch an outreach ministry, an outreach project, a method. And um, our, our TFM students created that very ministry. A testimony on one side, QR card on the other that we can give out like tracks. And so I find it very interesting to all the TFM students that I'll be encouraging to you that that exact method is being employed on the mission field. So I say good job to our TFM students. Another thing worth mentioning is an art camp that Lily and I are leading on Wednesdays this June and July with the hope of reaching kids with the gospel. We had the first class on June 7th. Lily has invested a lot of time in preparing the art ideas and materials for the class. My job has been simply to prepare the gospel lesson at the beginning of each class. P please pray that the Lord will move these kids, move on these kids' hearts. Finally, we are continuing to, to pray that the Lord will open doors. Getting connected with people still proves to be the biggest challenge for doing ministry here in Taiwan. I'm also praying that the Lord would give me five young men to start studying the Bible with. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? This is exactly how Brother Walls started his ministry there. He now has four or five local churches started just because the Lord gave him five young men to begin studying and begin training. So now Brother Smith is praying for the same thing. Please pray that he will bring people to us and, that, and, and take us to them. Please also continue to pray for the people the Lord has allowed us to meet up with already and pray for Peter, a man I mentioned in my last letter. We have been meeting for coffee the past month or so, and this week we will start studying the Bible together. Thank you so much for your prayers and support. Again, that's from Brother Andy Smith and his wife Lily. And they are busy in Taiwan. I, I have to be careful what I say because we have young men that are returning from Taiwan, and I want you to hear their testimonies, and I want you to hear about what they've done while there. But one of the things you're going to hear from them is something that I wish every American Christian could get a handle on. We think of missionaries as people who look weird and act weird and go to other countries and spend all day preaching and praying. That's how we view things. Now, you're going to find out if you spend any time on a mission field, it's just setting up life in another country. You're going to find out that they go about meeting people the same way we meet people, in coffee shops, at restaurants, at markets. It's just living as a Christian on another field and walking through doors of opportunity as the Lord opens. And I'm telling you, anybody can do it. We shouldn't be afraid, shouldn't be scared of the mission field. It's just simply setting up life in a, in a new place. All right, let's stand together. You can shake hands with one another. We'll get ready for our Wednesday night offering. Brother Burchett can't be here, so Brother Steve, could you make sure some guys are ready for that? Welcome somebody to church this evening just as we get ready to receive our offering.
You can be seated this evening. Ushers, come on with those offering plates. Brother James, get ready to sing during the offering, if you would, please, sir. Uh, as the ushers are coming, a couple of announcements really quick. Uh, there will be a, uh, a prayer meeting at my house this Saturday at 6 p.m., and everyone's invited. Sometimes before we have a special service, uh, the Lord will lay on my heart just to get together and pray about the service, and so that's what we're doing. Our Bible conference starts Monday, and I'd like to just gather at my house and spend some time in prayer for that meeting. Uh, the, the preachers and their, their families are making their way into town on Monday, so there's just a lot to pray about. And so if you wouldn't mind joining with us Saturday at 6 p.m. at my house, we'll spend a few minutes in prayer. Uh, if you're planning to come, though, if you could sign up in the foyer, that would help me and my wife plan accordingly. And then uh, if you're planning to come, write down your name and how many are coming with you. And then if you're able to bring um, a, a snack, a bag of chips, don't, don't go spend all day baking anything, don't do that. But if you're able to bring a, a bag of snacks of some sort or a, a two liter of pop, just write that down as well so we know how many uh, snacks we have coming. And that would help us plan accordingly. Okay, again, that is Saturday at 6 uh, p.m. And uh, we'll try to have everything wrapped up by 8 p.m. We're not going to stay all night, uh, but we want to spend some time praying for the meeting coming up. All right, uh, Saturday uh, is going to be the Ninja Warrior competition. See Brother Steve Wireman if you have questions about any of that. And then, of course, Sights and Sounds tomorrow night. If you're working Sights and Sounds, make sure you're, you know where to be and what time to be there. Sunday will be the last day that we have... Uh, you're able to sign up for the Israel trip. We're going to be taking a trip to Israel next year, June 20th through the 29th. And um, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed by the response. I think we're up to 31 people that have expressed interest. Now, all those people may not be able to go, but 31 people have said that they'd like some more information or at least come to the meeting to find out some more information about it. Uh, but Sunday will be the cutoff. If you haven't told me by Sunday, uh, then it'll just be too late. And uh, as soon as Sunday is over, uh, we'll schedule a meeting with everybody, get everybody together, and we'll try to answer as many of your questions as we, um, as, as we can. All right. Lots of people traveling and out of town, so make sure you pray for those folks. If you have a prayer request that you need added to the prayer list this evening, prayer request cards are in the pew there in front of you. Fill those out and drop those in the offering plate in just a moment. Um, I'm not sure if it made it to the prayer list yet, but it will by the end of the service. Miss Alice Burchett started having some chest pains, I believe, this afternoon. And um, as of just about an hour before the service, she was still in Chelsea ER, and they were running some tests. Most of the tests had come back looking good already, but they were going to admit her and keep her a little while and just to make sure everything is good with her. Um, Brother Conrad Conley is still in Chelsea uh, Hospital as well. They're going to keep him a little while longer. He's got several blood clots in his lungs that are trying to break those up safely and resolve those issues. He's also got some things going on with his heart, they're not, or, or liver rather, that they're not too sure about. And then Doug Conley, uh, their, uh, their adult son, he's been confined to a wheelchair his whole life because of a car accident. He's still in University of Michigan ICU on a respirator and uh, no real improvement there. So keep praying for him as well. And there was one more request I was supposed to tell you about. Brother Bob Halfstead, Lord willing, is going home Friday. So I need to continue to pray for him. He's got a little bit more of a recovery, but pray for him. Frank Duncan is who I was trying to think of. Uh, Brother Frank uh, had an accident with his gas grill. I'm not sure of the details, but he burned himself qu quite severely the way it sounds. He's at home, but he asked that we pray for him. All right. So I think all of those will make the prayer list this evening. So don't try to remember those. You don't have to. They should be on the prayer list. You can pick that up at the end of service. All right. Brother Jenkins, would you lift your voice good and loud, please, sir, and ask the blessing on the offering.
fortune, my guilt was old fashioned. God's love was old fashioned, I know. And the way I was saved was the old fashioned way through the blood that makes whiter than snow. Old fashioned because I be. Let's get our Bibles this evening. Brother Leonard, thank you for filling in for Luke. They are out of town and appreciate your help. Let's get your Bibles and stand with me. Find Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I hope that you are looking forward to uh, the Bible conference the next week. I'm telling you, the, the, uh, the preaching is going to be, um, it's going to be good, solid Bible preaching. And uh, that's the kind of preaching we need. I hope it's the kind of preaching that you, you, you like and that you long for. There's a lot of preaching that goes on in churches that uh, it's just not biblical preaching. Uh, and um, it's just because you find a word or a phrase in Scripture that you like doesn't mean you get to use it however you want. And uh, sometimes we deprive Scripture of its richness and its intended value by simply preaching the message to our liking instead of to the standard of the context of Scripture. And so next week we're going to get a lot of biblical preaching. Just Romans chapter 5 will never be the same to you if you will come next week and let, let these guys expound the Word of God. And they're not the only ones that can do that. I know that. But the Lord has allowed our paths to cross with some great Bible preachers. And the next week we're going to hear five, or four of them rather. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. I hope that you're uh, looking forward to it. All right, uh, let's uh, read Galatians chapter 3, 
and then we will uh, we'll read a couple of verses there, and then we'll pray and to see what the Lord has for us. I better find it instead of just trying to quote it. Galatians 3, uh, we've, we've already preached this passage, but there's one thought we need to review and to see a few more things about before we move on. And let, so let's start reading it from verse 1, and we'll read down uh, to about verse 8. It says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Oh, ye fo- are you so foolish, Galatians? Are you so foolish? I'll get it right. Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Before I read further, you need to pay careful attention to that question at the beginning of verse 4 because it's going to make a difference tonight. Verse 5 says, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are not under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Father, would you help us tonight, Lord, give us wisdom with your word, Lord, help me as I preach, God, keep me from, uh, from crossing the line from your perfect will into my will, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We have spent a great deal of time in the book of Galatians discussing salvation by grace alone justification by faith. We have spent a great deal of time looking at how we are saved by grace through faith. That is an important doctrine that I don't know, I don't know it's possible to over-preach that. But if we're not careful, we will, we will preach that doctrine to the point that we miss the larger context of Galatians, the book of Galatians as a whole. If at this point I were to simply ask each individual person who's been here for a large number of the sermons from Galatians, if I were to ask them, what is the book of Galatians about? Undoubtedly, the vast majority, maybe all of them, would say something like justification by faith, without the works of the law. And that is a topic that comes up over and over again in the book of Galatians. But hear me, that is not the topic of Galatians. The book of Galatians was written to the church of Galatia. Only people who are saved are a part of the church. So the context, the larger context of the book of Galatians is not the proper way to be saved. These people are already saved. So if it's not salvation by grace through faith, without the works of the law, then what is the larger context? What is, the, what, is it, what is the message to the Galatians? Now, we find hints about it throughout. But let me give you a couple of verses that, that just proclaim it so clearly, and then we'll get into the, the body of the message this evening. All right, find, you're already in Galatians 3, but find Galatians 1. Galatians 3 and Galatians 1. Galatians 1 verse 6 says, 
I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, from verse 6 of the very first chapter of Galatians, the Apostle Paul brings to the forefront, brings as a main idea, main thought, the fact that he marvels not that they're saved, but what they've done since they've been saved. He says, I came to you and I preached the gospel of the grace of God unto you. You started out in faith. You got saved by faith. But I marvel that since then, you've removed from that faith into another place. Okay, so we see it's not a debate about whether they were saved. It's about what they've done since they were saved. Do you see the difference? Now, all the way through the book of Galatians, we find the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. There's no question about it. But I'm telling you tonight that if we make the entire book of Galatians about the right way of being saved, the only way of being saved, then we have missed the biggest theme, the biggest message of the book of Galatians. Because if I were to ask all those here this evening that are saved, if I were to ask you to raise your hands, the vast majority of us would raise our hands. And then if I were to ask you, if you believe you got saved by grace through faith alone, raise your hand. Everybody would raise their hand. So then we could say, okay, well, we don't need the book of Galatians. Right? I mean, I'm not saying we don't need it, but I'm saying we know we're saved. We know how we got saved. So why are we spending six years looking at the book of Galatians? Here's why. The Galatian church needed to hear this message just as badly as Faith Baptist and Chelsea needs to hear this message. Because so many people today know they're saved. They got saved the only way they could be saved, by grace through faith. But we have lost touch with the biblical teaching of how we're supposed to live since we got saved. And that was the church of Galatia's problem. Paul says you started out well. But I've heard that since you got saved, you've removed yourself from him that called you. Not that they were unsaved, not that they had lost their salvation, but they were saved by grace through faith. And we're gonna find out that that is the way we're supposed to live every day of our lives after we're saved. And it matters. Now, you, I just read that verse six of chapter one, flip back to chapter three. I'll give you another example of this, another proof that this is the bigger the bigger topic for discussion in Galatians. Look at chapter 3. Let's start in just verse 1 again. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. There it is. That was salvation laid out before them. They heard the truth. They started in the truth. Look at verse 2. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit. Hey, can you receive the Spirit and be lost? No, he's talking to saved people. He says, I want to know. Tell me, I want to learn this of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So he's talking to some people who have received the Spirit by the hearing of faith. Verse 3, are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? These are people who started out in the Spirit. They're saved. Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? This is the book of Galatians. Man, remember how fired up Paul was? We saw this in the first two chapters. He was angry. Two things made him angry. Number one, the, the people that came in behind him after he had preached the gospel, they came in and convinced the Galatians that I'm glad you're saved, but now that you're saved, you better keep the law or you're going to be in trouble. That made him angry. Second thing that made him angry is those same people that came in behind him and taught that bad doctrine also began to criticize him and began to say he wasn't a real apostle. He really had no authority and that he had his doctrine wrong. Those two things angered Paul. So I'll say again, we can find the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone in the book of Galatians. But that is not what the book of Galatians is about. 
The book of Galatians is about encouraging a New Testament church to live after they're saved the way the Bible says they ought to live, the way God wants them to live. All right, so before we get into this, just in your mind, you should make a mental note that most often, I shouldn't say most often because I have not, have not counted it up and, and divided it out, but very often, we'll say it that way, when the word flesh comes up in the church epistles or the word circumcision comes up in the church epistles, it's referring to either the law or the works that we do with our flesh. Or if you'll think of it in that way, it'll, it'll help make more sense as we go through not just the book of Galatians, but so many of the church epistles penned by the hand of Paul. All right, so when we talk about the flesh, as for example, he says here, uh, he says here in verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? When he says you're made perfect by the flesh, he's saying, are you made perfect? Are you made complete after you're saved? Are you completed by the works you do in your body? That's the question. And so think of it in, in, in those ways, okay? Now, let's get into the true context of the phrase, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. I want to read you the words to a song that uh, I know the choir has sung it. I don't, I don't know that we've sung it as a congregational, uh, but let me, let me read you the, the words of this song. Page 873, if you want to read along. Living by faith. Page 873, here's what it says. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord, I know, ruleth o'er everything, and all my worry is vain. First they blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The master looks on at the strife. I know that he safely will carry me through, no matter what evils be tied. Why should I then care, though the tempest may blow, if Jesus walks close to my side? Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. All right, that hymn so clearly puts into to musical form the message of the book of Galatians. The message of the book of Galatians is, I'm glad you're saved, but I'm not satisfied with the way you're living since you've been saved. Well, let's look at it together very, very quickly. Uh, we'll have to hurry this evening um, the just shall live by faith. This is a th recurring theme. Look at verse 11 in chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law of the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree." That the blessing of Abraham might come upon or come, come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay, we're saved by faith, but according to Scripture, we are to live by faith. Live by faith. Uh, let me give you a few thoughts, and then we'll make a comparison to Jesus Christ and our lives at the very end. Uh, I told you to pay careful attention to verse 4. And the first thing we need to point out is that phrase, having suffered so many things. The Galatians had suffered many things since they were be, had, had been saved. And Paul was telling them that so many of the things that they had suffered were as a result of them placing their faith in Jesus Christ. And, and we can glean from the context that those, uh, those religious Jews that had come into Galatia after Paul had departed... 
they began to preach that, that, that works salvation to the Galatians, not works to be saved, but works in order to stay saved. It works in order to garner the blessing of God on your life. So remember the description, how I have described Galatia to you at the time of the starting of the church? A very barbaric people, primitive by even those standards of that day 2,000 years ago. Uh, history records that the Galatians, uh, they, were, they were mercenaries, basically. They were very skilled with a sword, and uh, they, uh, they would just hire themselves out to whatever king or army needed their help. Uh, they were so brutish that they would walk around the streets naked. They thought nothing of, of complete nakedness. And uh, they made sport of all kinds of death. And, and it was just a very, very, uh, very uh, brutal and primitive, I don't know any other word for it, violent uh, um, a culture. So you can imagine those people, uh, they, were, they were as superstitious and pagan religiously as they, as they were primitive culturally. They were, they, they, every God in the world, they welcomed, they wanted to please everybody. So when Paul came in and preached salvation from your sins, uh, salvation for eternity by grace through faith, some believed. But when they believed, they began to be uh, the ones who received blame for anything bad that happened in the region. Earthquakes, it was the Christian's fault. A disease, that was the Christian's fault. Invasion, that was the Christian's fault. Defeat on the battlefield, that's the Christian's fault. Because they've excluded all the other gods and they've, they've, just, they've just highlighted and they're serving one god. They've angered all the other ones. That was the philosophy. And as a result, the Christians had begun to suffer. They had begun to be persecuted. They had begun to be pushed further and further to the side and even completely out of view of society. So Paul is saying, these people that came in unto you and said, you're saved, but you must have the law now. He says, you've suffered so much and it's not made any difference. And so verse four asks that question. All that you've suffered, have you suffered it in vain? Because you've been convinced you've got to keep the law, but you're still suffering. Paul is pointing to the fact that suffering is part of the human condition as a whole, but maybe even unusual and extraordinary suffering might just be the lot of the followers of Jesus Christ. Makes no, you're not suffering because you're not keeping the law. Uh, you, you began in the spirit, and now you're trying to be made perfect through the flesh, and it's not working. He's pointing to the obvious. Have you ever sat back and seen some of the shenanigans that go on on the religious channel on TV? Have you ever seen some of this nonsense? People get mad when I name names, but I don't care. Benny Hinn is a fraud. He's a liar. He's a con man. And on TV, listen, a man takes his coat off, Benny Hinn takes his coat off and waves it over the crowd and hundreds or thousands of people are slain in the spirit. And then he'll get up and solicit and ask for money to be sent to him so that he can keep going around the world doing what he's doing for Christ. And people line up and say, here's my money. You see that and you sit back and you say, how do they not see through this? How do they not see the fraud? of this well here's the apostle paul and he's scratching his head he's telling the galatians how do you not see this you started out in the spirit by faith they come along and they try to tell you your problems you're not keeping the law look at how you're suffering it's not helping you at all here is here, here's what paul is going to to teach the galatians he's going to teach them that you got saved by grace through faith, and now you are just in the sight of God. You're justified. But hey, church, the just shall live by faith. Faith is not just a, a factor in salvation. It is a dominating factor in the lives of those who are justified. That's what he's going to, and now here's what he's going to say even through suffering, the just live by faith. Suffering has no bearing on, on the just. Those who are truly saved, suffering does not make them question their salvation. 
Now, I feel so unqualified to even make comments on this topic because I've suffered so little in this life. And I would even say, I, I don't know that I have suffered at all for the cause of Christ. But we're reading about some people who did. So first of all, Paul points to the fact that the suffering, he asked them, is it in vain? Have you suffered all these things for no reason? Number two, he makes very clear that we are saved by faith and now we live by faith. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Let's back up to verse, so let's look at verse 15. We who, this is Galatians 2.15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for the works of the law shall no, or for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified." I said, there's salvation. I told you, it's all the way through. There's salvation without the works of the law. If you see that, say amen. amen. All right, so we're not disagreeing. We understand that the book of Galatians does mention salvation. But look down, down in verse, I'll look at verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I, what to say, now live. He's saying, I know I'm saved. I'm justified by faith without the law. But now the life that I'm living, look what it says. The life which I now live in the flesh. That's this earthly life. That's, that's the movement every day. It's how we conduct ourselves. It's what the Bible refers to as our conversation. All right? The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know what the Apostle Paul is saying? He's saying, I got saved. I got justified without the law. I was, I'm now dead to the law but Christ lives in me, and now I have a new life. And I was saved without the law, and now the life which I now live, I live without the law. I don't need the law. I don't rely on the law. It doesn't keep me saved. It doesn't make me more saved or less saved. He said it's Jesus Christ. It's Christ in me. It's, it's, it's faith of the Son of God. He says it's necessary for salvation. And it's necessary after salvation. I don't know how he could be any clearer. He says we're saved by faith, but we also live by faith. This should, now it, it probably won't be, but this should, could be a revolutionary concept in so many of our lives if we would learn to live by faith. In the Bible, rarely does living by faith simply mean, well, I have some needs and I don't know how I'm gonna, I don't know how I'm gonna meet them, so I'm just gonna live by faith. It rarely does it mean that. You know what it usually means? It usually means almost exclusively in the letter epistles to the church. It means whatever I encounter or endure, I'm still going to be trusting Jesus. No matter what someone tries to lure me or bait me into giving or doing to help my situation, I'm just going to trust Jesus. And if all the world forsakes me and says, and, 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 and says they want nothing to do with me, I'm still going to trust in Jesus. And if I have lots of friends or no friends, I'm still going to trust in Jesus. And no matter what the TV preacher says about sending money or sowing a seed in order to reverse whatever calamity I've encountered, I'm going to reject all the works of my flesh and just keep trusting Jesus. That's the message to the Galatians. 
And that's the message to us today. Saved by grace through faith. Living every day of our lives by grace through faith. Jesus Christ hasn't lost one ounce of his power and ability to preserve us. And hey, bad things are going to happen. This week, I've, I've received phone call, probably, probably eight or 10 phone calls from people that I know are, are, are Christians, people I would call good people. Preacher, please pray for me, this just happened. Please pray for me, this just happened. Preacher, I don't know why this is happening. Please pray for me. You know what I could do? I could say, well, I've noticed your attendance at church has been lacking lately. Maybe this is God punishing you. I could say that. I could say, I haven't looked at the giving records, but uh, I'm guessing you probably haven't given as much as you probably could. If you watch TV, that seems to be the route religion goes, right? Or I could say, in spite of all of that, you're still saved. Nothing can touch that salvation. Not a doctor's report. Not a, not a change in an employment. No, nothing can change that. We started by faith. And one day we're going to finish by faith. And so the song says, I care not today what the morrow may bring. If sunshine may be a sunny day, what if it's that tempest blowing? I'm never alarmed at the overcast sky. The master looks on at the strife. He hasn't changed. There's not some mystical formula to try to appease God into blessing your life. He's not bought. He's not purchased that way. He just wants those who are justified by faith to live by faith. And when the world around us falls apart, we can rest securely in our Savior knowing, hmm, I'm going to live by faith. That's the message of Galatians. All right, so what does this look like? We, we have to hurry. I'm, I'm sorry, we have to, we have to hurry. Let's, let's skip a few things here. Let's get right on down into what I think would be the biggest help to us tonight. Let me just jump to this last point. It really, it really is a question, and we no longer have to look at the law for instruction on how to live. We now look to Jesus Christ. He, we don't need the law. We're dead to the law. I have to say this, everybody look right here just for a second. I have talked so bad about the law this evening. I am not saying the law serves no purpose. I'm simply saying the law serves, Old Testament law serves no purpose for saving me, has no power to save me, and it has no power to keep me saved. That's what I'm saying. Paul said that law, it was good. It was good. Hey, it brought me to Christ. That law showed me how bad I really was. We need that law. After I'm saved, that law is not a bounding uh, or a boundary, rather. It doesn't have me in bondage, but I can look at that law and I learn a whole lot about the essential divine character of God and what pleases him and what doesn't. And I can choose to use that as a starting point for my worship and service to God. But that's not going to exempt me from suffering in this life. And that's what Paul is telling the Galatians. So how are we supposed to live in spite of suffering, well, let's look at Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who suffered more than any of us ever will. How did he suffer? Find two places very quickly. Find 1 Peter chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 12. 1 Peter chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 12. Oh, I have to hurry so fast right now. I'm, I'm going to start reading. You catch up when you get there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says this. Now, now, we're coming out of Hebrews 11, which talks about the suffering of the saints of God. It talks about people who were stoned, who were sawn asunder. They were shipwrecked. They were beheaded. They, all these bad things happened to them. All right? So then we get to chapter 12. And the, the question of chapter 12 is, how are we going to endure such suffering? Well, look what it says in verse 2. Here's how we do it. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy uh, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. For consider him, that's Jesus, uh, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So here's what it says. You want to know how you can suffer and still continue living by faith? 
Just look to Jesus Christ, who, as the passage says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So here's what it is. Hey, Christian, you know how you can endure this suffering right now and still manage to live by faith? You can do that by looking what is set before you. Jesus Christ looked at the joy set before him. What was the joy set before him? I'll tell you what it was. It was the church of God, the redeemed ones, those regenerated. He calls them his reward in in, in Revelation. As Jesus suffered and bled on Calvary, uh, I know all the songs are great, beautiful beautiful songs. His love love for us held him on the cross. I don't know about all that. All I know is that Jesus Christ begged his father in prayer in the garden before Calvary to let it pass from him. He begged God to find some other way to do this, but then he said, not my will, thine be done. On Calvary, he says, he confesses to Pilate, I'm not under your control. I could could call legions of angels right now to deliver me. He says, but there's something more important going on here. There's some joy set before me. There's a reward for my sufferings. That's us. Do you know how overwhelming that is? Jesus endured it all, faithfully to the end, because he focused on the reward before him, not on the current suffering. That's what the passage says. Why are we told that in Hebrews? We're told that because there's some Christians who ask the question, is the suffering worth it? I mean, if I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't be enduring some of the things I'm going through. My family wouldn't treat me this way. I wouldn't be passed over for the promotion at work if I, if I would just agree to work during church days. Is it really worth it? It's not worth it if all you look at is the here and now in the middle of suffering. But if you'll look at the joy set before us, this world is not the end. It gets so much better when this is over. So just keep pushing on, living by faith. There's going to be sorrow. There's going to be sadness. There's going to be loss. But Hebrew says, just look at Jesus, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Most of our suffering, a lot of our suffering, we don't have an exit. We just have to endure it. Do you realize Jesus, he confessed to Pilate that he had an exit. I could call for relief and help. But he said, that joy that's before me, I'll never see it. I'm going, to, I'm going to going to be faithful. And then we're told that even through suffering, just live by faith. The just live by faith. That's how we live. Whatever this world throws at you, won't matter. First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two. All right, let's read this. I'm going to go quick. I'm going to sound like I'm speaking in tongues probably, but you just keep up, all right? Let's start reading in verse 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if then ye do, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Did you catch that? If you're going to follow in his footsteps, it's the road of suffering. That's what we're reading. Peter and Paul agree perfectly on this. Look what it says next, verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You know what that committed himself to? You know what that that means? He lived by faith. He just threw himself on his father and said, I'm at your mercy. That's what we do. The just shall live by faith. We just say, God, I'm all in, good or bad, whatever happens, I'm yours. Job said it this way, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That's living by faith. Verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Now here, let me make some comparisons very, very quickly. Jesus suffered. 
How did he suffer? Well, he suffered grief. That's what we just read. He suffered grief. Isaiah 53 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Verse 10 of Isaiah 53 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Well, how are we supposed, how, how are we supposed to, to live? The passage just said in verse 19, For conscience toward God endure grief. We just live by faith and endure it. That's what it says. How did Jesus suffer? Well, he suffered grief. Number two, he suffered, uh, he, he suffered um, unjustly, wrongfully. That's what, that's what we read about. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews 2, 9. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. He suffered wrongfully. How do we suffer? Well, verse 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. It's all about how we live after we're saved. It's living by faith. That's how Jesus suffered. That's how we're going to suffer. Number three, he was buffeted. He was buffeted. We find this in Mark 14, he was Mark 26. If you don't know, the word buffet means to, with a closed fist, to smite somebody. That's what buffet means. The soldiers buffeted him. He suffered that way. Remember, Hebrew says, look no further than Jesus for your example on how to live, how to endure suffering. Well, he was buffeted. Here's how we're supposed to suffer. 1 Corinthians 4.11, even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. 1 Peter 2.20, we just read it. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your fault, ye take it patiently, but if when you do well, ye suffer, there it is. If he, he was buffeted, if we get buffeted, we just live by faith. We don't give up. It doesn't talk us out of it. We just live by faith. He patiently endured. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, talks about him enduring, despising the shame, all of those things. Hebrews 12, 3, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. It talks of his patient suffering. 1 Peter 2, 20, we take it patiently. How about being reviled? Mark chapter 15, verse 31, 32, talks about how they reviled him, they they mocked him. They, 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 he, they, they jested at his expense. That's how he suffered. Well, if he's our example, we should be prepared to follow in his steps. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12 says, And labor, making with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. You see, the message is all the way through. You're saved. You're justified. Now, the just live by faith. We don't surrender our faith in the face of adversity. We live by our faith through the adversity. You see the difference? That's why I say we do a great disservice by making Galatians about how we get saved. Because the message to the Galatians was, here's how you get saved, how you got saved, but here's how you're supposed to be living since you're saved. Let me read you two verses and I'll have to be done. This concept of the joy set before us being what motivates us to live by faith through suffering, it's all the way through our New Testament. We find in Romans chapter 8, verse 17 says this, And if children, then heirs and heirs of God, joint heirs of Jesus Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may, we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The Apostle Paul says, I'm suffering greatly right now, but the only way I'm going to get through this living by faith is as I stop thinking about the suffering. And if I do think about it, I'm just going to compare it to the glory that's waiting after, and there is no comparison. That's what he says. That's what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says this, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor eat, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Here's what it means. In spite of your suffering, just keep living by faith because you can't even imagine what God has prepared for you in, the, in eternity to come. That's the message. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, here it is. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. John says, hey, Christian, just, just hold on. Just hold on because... We, you have no idea what he's going to transform you into. You have no idea what glorification really is. One day we will. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of tomorrow? No. The hope of deliverance from this trial? Nope. The hope of glory. The hope of glory. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that Moses listed in the hall of faith. The only reason he found himself in the hall of faith was because he chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the riches of Egypt. That's what your Bible says. Listen, folks, you're saved by faith. That means you're justified. In the sight of God, you're, you're just. Well, the just, they live by faith. I'm glad you're saved by faith. How are you living? What causes you to compromise? What causes you to search for something to add to your salvation to make life better? Just live by faith. The faith that saved you, keep trusting in Jesus Christ. He's all we need. Let's stand together, please. Father, thank you for your word. Father, I'm convicted at the way so many times I become frustrated and impatient with this world and the things that we endure in this world, and though we've suffered so little, Lord, I ask that you would please remind me often that the just shall live by faith. God, keep us from diminishing the glory of the gospel by trying to add our works to it. Lord, you tell us in the gospels, you tell us throughout the church epistles that Suffering is just part of this life for your people. God, would you help us accept that and then, Lord, look to you as the, as the example of perseverance through suffering. God, help us see the joy that's set before us as we endure this life. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The prayer lists are on that back table. I would invite you to make your way to the back. Grab one. And uh, you can shake hands with one another. Brother Steve's going to come and lead us in prayer in just a couple of minutes. And uh, we'll have some prayer time around the altar. But grab a prayer list and make your way back to your seats.